Okay, we're going to continue with this discussion of Metropolis Hastings, and we have to insert a whole bunch of knowledge about markup chains. I'm not going to give you a full proof of the algorithm yet. I think what we're going to do is I'm going to make you understand how to implement this algorithm, what the issues are, get you to practice it a little bit, take you one more step in the give sampling that takes all of 15 seconds to uh, understand what the implementation looks like. I'll make some claims, and then later we'll come back and do the proofs. And why MCMC are always proving to themselves about the algorithm. It's usually the same thing. And so, um, I have to make you understand some Markov theory before we can prove anything. So, anyway, um, audibility is a lot different, right? So, and I know it is with this as well. When you guys, um, when I call on you, speak loud so I can hear you. I, I keep going back in the videos and I'm like, I can't hear it. So, perfect. And I can always hear Alex. So, he's good. Everybody can always hear me. I know some of us are talking real quietly. So, it's the moment for us to hear your voices. There's probably going to be a lot of questions about stuff. Um, I like practical questions. I like theoretical questions. They're both important. Uh, we're in the middle of understanding Markov processes. Markov processes only depend on their paths through their last iteration. So their most recent paths. Uh, MCMC algorithms kind of march around until they find the stationary distribution. And when they find what it's trying to sample from, they stay there. So MCMC algorithms are converging to distributions, stationary distributions. Technically limiting distributions, and if your chain is well constructed, they are the same thing. So I need to show you some examples on that. This is your burn-in period. So I'm just kind of saying these are my particular steps where it took. So this is my choice. It's wandering until it finds something, and when it finds it, it does not leave. So it marches around the distribution, spending an amount of time in an area that's proportional to um, the area under that curve of the target distribution. That's what sampling does. The whole point in statistics is understanding that. Uh, Monte Carlo people exploit it in their algorithms. Statisticians exploit it in their inferences. These are different things, but it's all the same sort of math. Cool. Um, I'm going to rewrite this algorithm for you so we can understand it through an example. We need some definitions, stationary um, distribution and limiting distribution. I'm going to walk you through that in a moment with an uh, example, and then I'll tell you technically what they are. Um, and we need to understand these three words also. Um, I lump these together and I say these three conditions are the ergodic conditions. Some people bundle two of them and say that's ergodicity. It depends on which stochastic process book you look at. But any time they talk about ergodicity only consuming two of these, they always tack the other one on. The a periodicity term. Um, I use them together. That's what ergodicity is. Here's a fact. If your Markov chain has these three properties, your stationary distributions and your limiting distributions are the same things. So I need to make you understand that before we uh, go too much further. But let me just ask you guys, what are these terms? Anybody want to take a gander? Somebody's read about them. I do understand mathematical notation pretty well. And it can kind of for most people, um, kind of remove the point of each condition. Why do you need these conditions? So, anybody ever had an experience with Markov chains before? Okay, now you get to just lie. <laughs> so, um, I'll not pull the teeth since it's Monday. Um, let's just talk about a periodicity first. I want people have a hard time understanding this one. What this means in words is that the amount of time, or let's say it this way, um, 
a priori history means that a state in the Markov chain can be reached on any iteration. So we've talked about the one-step transition process, the two-step transition process, and the n-step transition process. So Markov chains are just walking around spaces. Now, where they go is determined by the probability of transitioning. If you're in a continuous state space, that would be a density for you, same sort of concepts that we're used to. Uh, but it says you can get to any state on any iteration. This is very important. So it means that it's not predetermined where you're going to show up. There's no funny cycles. So a counterexample to a periodicity would be if I could only arrive at states um, on multiples of three, something like that. So I could only see state two on step three, step six, or step nine. I'd never be able to see it on step seven. Impossible. Now, this is an eventually sort of claim. So, eventually. Doesn't have to happen right away. It's very important. So it might be that, well, on the first step, I can't get to anywhere. But after a while of mixing through my Markov chain, then I could see a particular step on maybe the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th iteration. All of those are possible. But at the first kickoff, it might be that only some states are achievable. So this means eventually in the sequence, I can land on any state at any iteration after I take a number of steps. Okay. So basically it says the process is random. It's not predetermined with this periodicity. I'll give you examples and counterexamples in a moment. These are the easier ones that people usually know. Let's do positive recurrence. Does anybody know what it is? Sierra? It's like when you start in state I, you'll go back to state I in like a finite amount of time. Yeah, that's right. She said it well. So it means that any state you can return to it in a finite amount of time. So, can return to state I, some state, one of these things, this is a two-state Markov chain that's being represented, so can return to state I in a finite amount of time. This has to be true for all. Give you a counterexample in a moment. So something that eventually might come back, but eventually it just drifts away. Your expected amount of time to return is infinite. That's different from saying the probability of returning is zero. It's becoming vanishingly unlikely that you're going to return, but it doesn't actually have to be a zero. So, just means that the states will reoccur. That makes sense. So, here we have a term that says the process is random to you. It's not predetermined happening in funny cycles. And we can return to every state. Irreducibility. Sierra, you're on a roll, so keep us going. Um, is it like the wording always gives me instant? From all states, you can get to another state. Yeah, let me just clean that up. Yeah. So, from any state, I can get to any other state. Yeah. Okay, so there's a path for me. So, all states communicate, is the way some people might say this. Communicate. So, communicate is where 
I'll say two states communicate, I and J, just give them some symbols, communicate if they're reachable from each other's starting point. If they, they are reachable from each other. state i, and eventually I can get to state j. It doesn't need to be in the first move. So you might look at your Markov transition matrix and see is there zero in row i on j. So you might be in row i, starting state, and look over to state j, and if it's a zero, you might go, oh, they don't communicate. But I don't have to go from directly from i to j. I can go through intermediate states to get there. So, it means that starting from anywhere, I can get to anywhere else, is what this says. This says that once I see a state, I will come back to it. It's going to happen. So this is the chance to see a state. So this is, I can get from anywhere to anywhere, eventually. And this condition says that it will happen and keep happening no funny patterns. So those are what those three definitions are doing for us. So I can get from anywhere to anywhere in the state space, maybe not in one move, but in a sequence of moves. And once I see a state, I'll return to it in a finite amount of time. So it's going to happen. It's not just possible, but it will happen. So these two conditions together say the state space will be explored. You will move around it. And it makes sense that if you have an exploratory algorithm like an MCMC algorithm, you need to be able to check everything out. What MCMCers do not like doing is checking everything out, though. They don't want to explore every state. So you might imagine on a grid, a two-dimensional grid, why not just compute you know, what all these transition probabilities are, figure out what my surface looks like. MCMC doesn't necessarily check everything out, it fills it in starts filling it in so you can run in like a continuous state space where you don't have any chance of checking everything out. You want to be able to explore and kind of move around that space. Kind of fill it all in. And that's what Bayesians are doing is we're filling in that posterior distribution and learning about it. And this says that we're doing it in a random way. So let's look at a few examples. Um, let's do Play like with um, non-positive recurrence. I'm going to come back and give a concrete example that we write down the algorithm on paper. Um, let me just give, kick it off with an example of something that's not positive recurrence. This is xt is equal to beta times xt minus 1 plus here. Right here. I'll make this normal sigma squared. So this is just a regression model. t goes from, I'll say, 0 out to some large some cap t. Of course, you will need to initialize this if you're going to run this. So you'll need to take x0 and set it equal to something. So I'll just say x initializer. So you need to initialize everything uh, to kick it off. Uh, sometimes this is a positive recurrent thing, and sometimes it's not. It depends on what this is right here. So if beta, 
And I'll say it this way, the norm of data, so if it's negative, this can also happen. If this is greater or equal to one, some people ask about that, that quality thing, one will mess you up. So that goes down the stationary. So if this is true, this is not positive return. So just think about what happens. Let's say I kick it off, I take x0, I pick it to be 1. Let's make beta 10 for this example. So if the next iteration I take 10, I multiply by 1, and I sprinkle some noise in there. Let's just let that be 1 so we can understand how much noise we sprinkle in there. So probably between negative and 3 and 3. How probably you picked up 99.7. So pretty likely you're between there. So I get some number between negative 3 and 3. Let's just imagine that I get a 2 right there. So now I have 10 plus 2, that's 12. Now I multiply by 10 again. That's 120. You can see what happens. It's going to start to break. So this is going to look like this. So it's a function of t. I'll have my x0 be some number. And basically, this is just going to keep going up and up and up. It'll go down a little bit sometimes, but it's going to keep drifting up if beta is 10. If it's anything greater than 1, it will do this. If it were 1.1, 1 .1, you might see something that looks like this. So beta is equal to 1.1. 1 .1. Doesn't really matter where it starts from. Basically, it'll drift slower. It can come back here. There's some probability of returning. That's even true here. But it's becoming vanishingly unlikely. Eventually, this will drift so far away that the probability of seeing zero, x zero while not, while not zero is becoming vanishingly small. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's even funnier, isn't it? If this was negative, then it kind of bounces around. It's flipping the sign on everything. But it doesn't really change my story. So it's just going to be jumping really far and jumping kind of erratically. That's OK for it to be a negative. So if it's greater than, um, if it's smaller than negative 1, that process is going to drift. And it's just going to be jumping back and forth, but it won't be coming back to the same thing. It's possible that it does, but the expected amount of time diverges. So that's at least um, a counterexample uh, to you. It can come back. The probability is not zero, because this has probability I can land anywhere in the whole space. So what's the probability? Let's say this marches. Um, 50 million standard deviations away from x0, there's still a non-zero probability I jump back on the next draw. I wouldn't count on it. And I certainly wouldn't make a bet that it would happen. So, it's not positive recurrent. So, I'll make the note. note. If data less than one. This is positive. So there's just an example. Um, let's go back to discrete state space stuff so I can show you in terms of matrices things that are going on. So remember that a limiting distribution so this very quickly last time. The limiting distribution concerns the n-step transition matrix. So the n-step transition probabilities are given by our transition matrix B 
these matrices are special because the row is sum to one. So the probabilities of going somewhere, if we're talking about probabilities, they better add up to one. They live between zero and one. All form of raw ops rules apply to all these things. And so it's a highly structured matrix. So what you're going to do is you're going to raise this to the nth power right here. So we looked at an example where we looked at the two-step transition matrix. We could see that A squared were the probabilities of starting in state I and moving to state J in two steps. The same is true for the N, power dot one. So the N step, step transition matrix is given by A to the N. Limiting distributions are defined by this. Take A, I'm going to raise it to the nth power. Eventually, I'm going to take a limit over N, but not quite so fast. So I'll say, um, I'll write that this. I think this is okay. Limit N goes to infinity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the ij element of this. So my notation is A gets powered up to the nth power and I look at the ij element of all of this. This is going to be pi j. There's no i there. So it's going to be a common probability of where I land. So this is independent of i. It's nothing to do with i. Not dependent. On pi. So this is the important bit. This doesn't always happen. There's not, this won't always occur. So sometimes this exists. Not always. So if our MCMC algorithm is going to work, what we're really doing is we're marching through an n-step process, and we're hoping it converges to something. And if it depends on the starting location, that's a problem. So this does not depend on i, which is the starting point. We're going to exploit this starting state. So we need algorithms that run regardless of where we started. If I said, well, it only works if you start it in the stationary region, you have to know the answer, essentially. You at least need to know where the mass is accumulating. So I want to show you an example of this. So not dependent on I, sometimes this doesn't exist. So let me run to my computer. Oh, why don't you launch your question and answer it? Oh, are you just holding your hand up? Let's just look at some examples. Try to understand what's going on. I'm going to write down a lot of mathematical formula, but it's probably better to just see. Understand what that condition is. Okay, let me make a probability matrix real quick. So, there's a Markov chain. I created this one real quickly. All I did is I made up some numbers. It's dense. I can go from anywhere to anywhere on one step. So already we can glance at this and go, okay, here we are. Because I can get from anywhere to anywhere. I don't even have to wait. It just happens. No matter where I start from, it happens because all the probabilities are non-zero. All those probabilities across the rows sum to one. You can verify that. So, probably want to do that. Sum A, that's not one, but in the other direction, everything sums to one. So, A transpose, sum dot, boom, those are the words. So, they don't have to sum in the other direction. That doesn't mean anything. So, of course, if 
they sum them the other direction, your Markov transition probability is symmetric. So the probabilities are going in both directions. That doesn't need to be the case. And that's certainly not the case in my example. Let's just look at a squared. So, so that's my two-step transition probability. They've changed. A3. Four. Noticing anything? It's converging to some fixed value. It looks like it's converging. The rows are converging. Speed it up, 10 steps. So those rows are converging. And these will converge to some finite value. And I can work out what those values are. I could either take this limit, be, be a very long process, powering this thing up. There's other ways to do this as well. And I'm going to show you one of those ways in a moment because I'm going to exploit some math that I know. This chain that we started with is ergodic. It's positive recurrent. I'll come back to everywhere. You can see that by glancing at the matrix because everything's dense. Um, I'll come back and find that amount of time. Uh, I can get from anywhere to anywhere, and I've got no funny patterns. So it's those three conditions that I need to know that a limiting distribution exists. And in that case, the limiting distribution will be stationary. So basically, these things are converging, and that's what my notation said, right over here. This is conveying that point. These are the column probabilities, and they're the same, and it doesn't have an I in there. So this is the way you read it on Wikipedia. And so that mathematical statement is telling you that this happens, converges to something. Uh, let's look at some Limiting distributions that might, or try to work out some examples where limiting distributions don't exist. So let's look at this. A, and I'm going to go to, uh, I'll stick with the three state thing for now. Now let's do two. I think it conveys the point just as one. That's the Markov chain, that's the identity. So, first way to work out chain, it sums to one. Right there, what's the limiting distribution? Let's raise this up to computer infinity. Go. Oh. Would have taken me a long time to do that calculation. It's a good thing that I know what happens when you multiply by the identity. Right here. So that totally depends on the starting location. If I start in state one, I stay there. And so this can't go from anywhere to anywhere. It's not even an eventually thing. Um, you get trapped instantaneously. So all states don't communicate with each other. A limiting distribution doesn't exist in this case. It's not going to converge. And so if I look back at my notation, that doesn't happen. It depends on the starting location. So this is not converging. Would it be violate? All kinds of stuff in those ergodic conditions right here. Let's look at another similar example. Got to get a feeling for why those three things have to happen for a limiting distribution to exist. You think about it conceptually. I've got to be able to move around the space and check everything out if I want to figure out what the probabilities are. I need to run this thing. But if I get trapped, it won't limit to the same thing every single time if I can get trapped in different places. Um, let's look at.
very similar, but different. Do all states communicate in this Markov chain? The previous one, they did not. You can't move from I to J. You can only move from I to I or J to J. What do you think? Flip. Flip. So it balances me around the state space, everything communicates. As soon as I go somewhere, I'll see it again. I actually can tell you exactly when I'm going to see it. It's not random. It absolutely depends on my starting location. And I can see the states on uh, multiples of two. So I can see one of the states on the even iterations and one of the states on the odd iterations. Um, it depends on where I started the Markov chain. So the limiting distribution doesn't exist here. So basically, we've looked at a bunch of examples where we can understand those three conditions. I need to be able to mix over the space, I need to be able to come back, and I need to not have these funny predetermined cycles. Um, stationary distributions are a little bit more forgiving. So let's think about this example. given 
I started in state jail. What I really need to do is define a random variable. You can call it x if you want to do, and say x is i. Uh, but I'm just going to write it out in words. Times the probability. will be consistent. Probability speed J. This should be equal to the probability. And I'm going to sum over j to the number of states. And I'm going to nickname these things. I've got just enough room to write down this is pi. This is pi j. These right here are my transition probabilities. And usually I denote these by A, J, I. There are those elements. You look at this, this says I'm coming from state J, and I'm moving to state I. And that's denoted by A, J, I, rather than A, I, J. About the other two terms, why the probability of a state J is pi i? Oh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Just because I said something ridiculous. Like, absolutely. That's pi i. That's pi i. That's, it wasn't supposed to be so something tricky. Just the gap. Which one? So this is going to be true. For all i. And all j. And so we're going to define our stationary distribution to adhere to this problem right here. And that kind of makes sense. If you ever take a probability class, you go rule of total probability. There's nothing that I've taught you here. I've just plugged in. Instead of calling these things just arbitrary probabilities, I've said this is my de definition of a stationary distribution. What do we normally call this? What do I normally call this probability right here when I talk about it in class? Those are the margins. Integrated everything out. In a continuous state space model, I would just change that sum to an integral. But it looks like a probability formula that we're used to dealing with. So I've got my conditional probabilities. Conditional probabilities define my joint probabilities for me. If I have all my conditionals written down, those are all the slices through the space in every direction, I've defined the joint distribution. Now there is a theorem that says the conditionals have all the information, yet they're compatible conditionals. If they came from a joint, they have the information that recreates the joint. It's called the Clifford Hammersley theorem. It's kind of obvious. So if I ask you questions like, if I gave you the margins, could you construct the joint? You'd say only if they're independent. Otherwise, I've lost information. But I could ask you another question. If I gave you the conditionals, can you reconstruct the joint? And it turns out, yes, you can. So it has all the information. And it's just out. Um, there's applications of that theorem. So these are just the marginal probabilities. That's what a stationary distribution is. And so stationary distributions can exist where limiting distributions might not exist. But if the limiting distribution exists, it is the stationary distribution. That's kind of a nice thing. So I need proposals in my metropolis Hastings algorithm that can get me around the space and don't have some funny, like, predetermined mechanism of when I select states to go explore. So this is all about the proposal. If the proposal can get you around, move you through the space, then this algorithm that I talked to you about last time, Metropolis, these things 
we'll explore the loose theory here. So it's all very conceptual. I need a proposal that can get me around the space. I also want to be proposing it to the mass of the space fairly regularly. I don't want to be checking out stuff that's way in the chaos all the time. It will eventually converge, but it'll convert very slowly if you do that. So that's the engineering aspect of MCMC. Let me write this down a little bit different. So that's all pretty conceptual. Stationary disk. Pi is equal to pi 1. Down with pi s. Right here satisfies this equation. Very obvious thing. I'll we'll write it down one more time. Just for prosperity's sake. So this is the probability of pi. Given J, probability of J. But my shorthand notation is okay. Is equal to the probability of Y. This is equal to the sum of A J I. Keep in mind, this is the confusing bit. My probabilities I write in this direction, and then the entries of the matrix are flipped in the reverse direction the transpose direction. So some, it's hard for statisticians sometimes to get this right. I see people go, oh, you've got to transpose that thing. If you forget to transpose it, you're going to have a lot of problems. So this is going to be times pi j is equal to pi i. And this is going to be for all pi. So this is a sequence of equations. I can write this down for I1, have this sum. Sum goes from over J. And I can enumerate. So let me just be real clear about this. A, J, 1, pi 1, pi J is equal to pi 1. Dot, dot, dot. Sum A J S pi J is equal to pi S. Cap S. Cap S. So I need to solve that for pi's. Anybody know what I'm doing? Looks just like this. Let me rewrite all of this. Probably the nicer way to write this. This is going to be A transpose. Times pi is the stationary distribution is equal to pi. Now I also need Pi J's. The sum to one. So if you forget to ask MATLAB for this, it will mess you up. So that's a constrained problem. Does that problem look familiar to anybody? Do you know how to solve problems like that? Oh. What's that? Now, because this is a matrix, and this is a vector. So it's the whole vector. That's the whole matrix. So this is a vector. This is the vector for state pi. The other one is for state k. That's that, and that's that. They're the same vectors. It's the whole vector. So here's what I want you to do, since you're slightly confused. This that. They're exactly the same. So the right hand side is that. This is the same. So you might be having a hard time with transposing your head, but that's the same system. So I'm just rewriting it differently. 
I think it's useful for people to probably write out the matrix, do the multiplication, see if it's that. So that's what everybody does if you're confused. You do that, you do it enough times, and then you can see it. If you don't do that, if you shortcut that in college, you will suffer all through graduate school. I would encourage you to work these things out. Longhand, that's what everybody does. So, at least we used to before we had computers. People understood what they were writing down, got acquainted with mathematics. But this is the same thing right here. Is this a familiar problem to you? I assure you, if you've taken any linear algebra class, this is an extremely important problem to you solve. What is it? It's the transition matrix. A transpose is the transition matrix transpose. Say something that doesn't make sense. Yeah, the whole the it's almost like that, but this is a little bit different because finding a solution to a linear equation looks like this. Ax is equal to b. They tell you these things, and then they have you solve that. But in my case, this is the same thing as that. So it's not just solving a linear equation. So in linear algebra class, when you first tell, take it, they teach you about A inverse. They have you work it. Then you take a numerics class and they tell you if you ever compute that A inverse explicitly, you're out of here. So did you guys know that if you actually take A inverse and compute it that way, on that lab, if you have a university license, your admission to the university will go So they're all connected through the cloud. They know you did it. They're coming through. Don't ever do that. <laughs> so that's the whole point of numerical analysis. This is why I created computer science in the first, part, the first place, is inverting matrix. Lots of algorithms for doing it. This problem is different. How about this problem? Have you ever seen problems that kind of look like this? I didn't value, I didn't make the problem. This fits into that form, but I don't have eigenvalue, but I do. It's one. So this is an eigenvalue, eigenvector problem, where the eigenvalue is one. And I'm telling you that this thing exists right here. Um, it turns out, here's some fun facts, that the biggest eigenvalue in a Markov chain is bounded by one. The biggest eigenvalue is one. So, um, the second biggest one is very important as well. The distance between those is called the spectral gap. Why is the eigenspace constrained to have eigenvalues less than one? Um, because of the row sum. This is an linear algebra class, so we're not going to prove that, but it's true. And so, Markov chains have eigenvectors that correspond to eigenvalue 1, they exist, and that eigenvector is called the stationary distribution. So that speeds up our math a lot. And you can solve this just by going for a solve. So it does turn out to be a linear solve. I'd multiply pi by the identity on the left-hand side, I'd subtract it over, and now I have a linear system that I can solve. Um, I think we're out of time right now. We're going to come back around to the metropolis Hastings algorithm, but that's ultimately what all this is. So let me just say it again. Limiting distributions are what your computer's actually clicking through. It's running through those transitions, constructing a limiting distribution. And if your proposal is well formed, you will be able to get from anywhere to anywhere in some amount of time. You'll be able to return, and it will be random. And so that limiting distribution is the stationary distribution. So I try to cram a whole semester into two days just to tell you these things. I'm not going to quiz you on all your um, Markov chain theory, but I want you to understand it. So you can understand what the algorithm's actually doing. So MCMC is all Markov theory. 
you want to do MCMC for a living, fun thing to pick up. Take a bunch of stochastics classes as well because you want to understand the properties of these spaces. We'll come back next time with our example. I think what we'll do is write down the example or talk about this example so we can actually um, talk about the general algorithm in the context of an example. Then we'll re-examine my code. And then I think we'll have fall break. So I will do review on Thursday night. So I'll still be around for that. Uh, Friday, we don't have class. On Monday, we're going to switch gears and come back around to prior distribution. So what are the properties? And Sierra's going to teach you about Jeffrey's prior. We will come back around to this and do a whole proof on uh, how the algorithm, how you prove that the algorithm is actually achieving its stationary distribution, which is ultimately sampling from the post -game. All I have to do to run this algorithm is write down the likelihood of privacy. Make sure I don't have any new airport mistakes and everything runs super smooth. Right, Sierra? <laughs> ha ha. So everything on a computer is more accurate than that. But in spirit, it's easy. All right, guys. We'll see you next time.